Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're just about to get started. Um, just a it looks like everybody found food and coffee, but it will be out for the entire morning. So please don't hesitate to grab more as you need. Um, I just want to say hi, welcome. We're so excited to see you all. My name is Elsie. I'm an events coordinator with our community outreach and engagement team. And I'm Liz. I am the survivorship uh, events coordinator. So we just wanted to go through a couple things. We want to make sure that everyone feels welcome today. So this is intended for people with non-metastatic um, breast cancer diagnosed within the last two to three years and before the age of 50, but we want you to know that you are all welcome here and we're glad that you're here. Um, we have both online people and um, in person, obviously, and we just want to say thank you all for joining us on a beautiful Saturday morning. Um, we will have opportunities to share throughout the morning, um, both times for your self-reflection, conversation within your tables. Um, if you are online, feel free to put um, notes in the chat. Um, we can um, discuss that way as well. And then you also have a little bit of time for journaling. Um, as far as intention setting, we want to make sure um, that you avoid your individual treatment plans um, and conversations of that sort. Um, limit comments about your healthcare team and interactions with them. Um, we will not be giving medical advice. That's, of course, for your doctors. Um, and we also want everyone to respect both the healing journey of everyone else and the confidenti confidentiality of everyone else. So just pay attention to what's around you um, and share, but make sure that it stays here. So. Um, so on the note of sharing some things, um, there'll be a few slides throughout today's presentation that are table talk. Um, and really that's meant for you to share how you are most comfortable. So if you want to share with your table, feel free to do that. If you would rather jot things down in a notebook, do that. Um, and if you are online, chat with us, write things down, however works best for you. Um, before we dive into our icebreaker, I want to spend a little bit of time introducing our speakers. Our first speaker is Kaya Verich. Kaya works as a nurse clinician in cancer survivorship at M Health Fairview. She has served as an oncology nurse for over 20 years in various capacities. As a survivorship nurse clinician, her role is to build the supportive care and survivorship services across the system. Um, she's passionate about this work and strives to ensure patients and caregivers have the knowledge and resources they need as they move through their cancer journey. And our second speaker today is Ashley Clark. She is a full-time oncology case manager and breast navigator at M Health Fairview in Wyoming, Minnesota. She has been in the position for about seven years and helps educate patients on their diagnosis and treatment if, um, and chemotherapy if needed, tri triage symptoms, and coordinate their care from diagnosis to survivorship and beyond. She is the go-to person for any questions and concerns and cherishes the relationships she has built with each of her patients. Prior to being a case manager, she worked in an oncology medical unit as an inpatient nurse. We're excited to have both of you here. Come on up. <laughs> Thank you all. As they said, my name is Kaya and I am uh, employed at M Health Fairview. And just in terms of how we're going to proceed through the day, um, Ashley and I will be going through sections. The sections are about 20, 25 minutes per topic. Please feel free to refuel your um, sugar or your fruit intakes, coffee and beverages are in there. And then the restrooms are out to the left if you need to. We will have a short break as we transition slides, but please, um, you know, do what you need to keep yourself active and refreshed in the session. And then we'll also, after the first two sessions, we're going to have um, a movement break and that will be optional it will be held in this room 
Um, but we'll, that's about a 20 minute period of some stretching and yoga activity. So again, please, we just are really grateful that you're all here to be with us. And we really wanna make this time be your own. We will invite conversation and comments during. We'll also have the breakout time, um, but certainly we are gonna keep on schedule, right? Cause we wanna make sure we get to through all the content and get you to lunch on time. And then we've got the afternoon breakouts. And that's where if there's really, um, uh, specific questions or a lot of conversation, we might table that to get it so that you can have the, those longer conversations in the deeper uh, in the deeper dive sections. Any questions before we get started? So the first topic here is hot and bothered menopause. So here are our um, goals for this session. We're gonna talk about how uh, breast cancer may have some temporary or permanent um, uh, early menopause symptoms, recognizing those symptoms and then talking about some possible treatments. So early menopause is defined as the natural absence of periods for one calendar year. Early menopause, therefore, is when periods stop earlier than that. The normal or natural age of 51 is about the average um, for women that are that's not treatment related. And that menopause may be temporary or permanent, depending on the type of chemotherapy you've received, your age, and then some other factors play into that as well. Um, and we also know, and likely you know as well, that this can be one of the most distressing causes or symptoms that are experienced within breast cancer treatment. Fertility may be affected because of chemotherapy, hormonal therapies, and then just general um, aging of the ovaries during your where you're at in your um, diagnosis age. And it really is important to have those conversations about fertility with your doctors, making sure you're understanding what, whether you're in treatment, what, what potential effects may be coming to you. And then also when you've completed treatment, what your future fertility options look like. And we do know though that pregnancy is considered safe for most people and there is not an associated risk of increased recurrence uh, for those women that have uh, pregnancies after treatment. I forgot to mention this in the um, early part of the presentation. We do have Living Beyond Breast Cancer is our sponsoring organization for this slide deck. And so we've got some really great videos as part of the presentations. And so after we do the videos, we'll watch them here and then we'll have some time to reflect um, as we move after the video. So I was diagnosed about three, almost four years ago, and I had the chemotherapy, which caused my ovaries to shut down. I went into menopause at 23. I guess some of the popular symptoms, which I also experienced myself, is just low sex drive um, and <laughs> discomfort during sex, um, and your, your period stops. So that was the only good part. So I can relate to a lot of those symptoms, especially the dryness. Um, being married in a dry vagina is not fun. <laughs> I think a lot of women are are surprised. Um, you know, at age 29 or 32, um, you're not thinking about menopause. Amenorrhea is the absence of having a menstrual cycle. And premature menopause happens in especially young women going through chemotherapy. There are certain chemotherapy agents that will increase the risk of um, losing their ovarian function or not being able to have periods any longer. And the highest offenders are usually the alkaline agents, which are pretty common in breast cancer uh, treatment. The hot flashes, I, I think that they're worse at night and I, I sleep with a fan on my face and, and my husband has um, like four blankets on and I'm sweating my you know, that's off. <laughs> for me, it was a little bit different because I have the BRCA2 gene, so I'm positive for that, uh, which forced me to get an oophorectomy. So I have everything. I have the hot flashes. I have the vaginal dryness, um, anxiety. I get like the panic attacks. 
The symptoms of premature menopause and natural menopause are the same. The, the difference is a patient who's young and we forced into menopause, the symptoms can be more severe. So guys, when did the menopausal symptoms finally go away for you? So if I think back, I mean, it's really only been um, almost two years. Um, there are times that I still experience the high flashes, which is why I keep popsicles on hand. So mine, I had menopause induced with the chemo for, and that was about six months. As soon as the chemo was over, uh, my periods came back and I started to feel better. And then I was, for the last three months, I've been on um, ovarian suppression where I give myself a monthly injection to prevent um, ovarian function. And that will be at for five years at the minimum. The proportion of patients who undergo an irreversible menopause is not entirely clear these days. A lot of our studies looked at older agents as far as chemotherapy is concerned um, and showed anywhere between 20 to 30 percent would have a permanent amenorrhea. But the complicating thing is the recovery of the ovary function can happen anywhere between six months to almost two years. Um, our newer agents, though, we're still unclear as to what impact they have on the ovaries. Age is a huge risk factor for permanent ovarian failure. The, the closer one is to a perimenopausal age, so over 40, uh, the more likely the loss of ovarian function permanently will occur. My oncologist set me up for um, an appointment with his nurse practitioner um, before I started chemo. And she's kind of the one who told me what to be prepared for. They um, Then my oncologist sent me to a sex doctor. She's a GYN who kind of specializes in menopausal type issues. My oncologist just mentioned a lot of the symptoms with chemotherapy, like hair loss, fatigue, things like that. But he very briefly mentioned the um, ovaries shutting down, but I mean, that's awesome that you got to see a therapist and things like that and had that support. Um, but I wasn't even aware that those things were available and, and I can seek help on that. So my doctor probably told me some symptoms and some things, but I think I was kind of at a place of still processing the fact that I was getting rid of these toxins going through my body. So she probably told me and I just really wasn't listening. The major thing about uh, menopausal management is that it's serious and that doctors like me need to take that seriously and um, provide some guidance and patients also need to bring it up as a as a, a concern because if it's distressing then it's something that we need to help relieve so did you ladies have hot flashes like how did you deal with the symptoms I try to take control over some of the, just some of the things that I could take control of, not overdressing for an occasion. So always wearing, I always wear usually like a light tank top or a um, short sleeve shirt underneath everything that I could take off. Also just not being embarrassed about it, not, not denying it, just saying, okay, I'm having a hot flash. Who's got a fan? Let's go. So I did start yoga uh, to kind of help me relax, not be as anxious and have anxiety. Um, so I've been doing that and I did uh, schedule for like acupuncture um, and massage therapy as well. So I'd seen commercials and I'd heard about vaginal dryness, but I guess until you really experience it, you really just don't know. So my husband was very patient and I'm certain at times he probably thought I was faking and I may have been, don't tell him. <laughs> so I didn't really want to try like those potions and creams and things of that nature. So I actually use coconut oil and it worked. I was completely surprised. Simple things can be done to help menopausal type symptoms. Physical activity uh, appears to be the panacea for poor quality of life and that can certainly help. There are medications that can help with menopause from uh, gabapentin to some of our antidepressants they have the added benefit of reducing the symptoms of menopause, especially the vasomotor symptoms or hot flashes. For women who don't want to take medications, complementary therapies can be of use, such as uh, acupuncture, such as hypnotherapy. So at 27, four years out of treatment, um, I'm really fortunate to say that I think I'm back to my normal self or what is my new normal. Um, 
my sex drive is back, the vaginal dryness has decreased significantly. Um, I don't think it's has gone away entirely, but it's it's getting there. It's getting better. I'm 35. Um, my menopause is here to stay uh, with ovarian suppression, most likely. So, you know, you learn to deal with these things. Over time, you, you find a strategy that works for you and, and just coming up with a game plan um, has really helped me. So in summary, and we can do a raise of hands here. Any folks, anybody see things on here that look familiar, feel familiar? Yeah, and I think the video did a really great job of talking about some of them, but of course there's others that we haven't fully touched on. And I just wanna call out, you know, in our afternoon session, we'll have Tara Rick here, who will be doing a, the deep dive on the sexual wellness piece. But this is where we're gonna have our first table talk. So, and I think we're gonna um, do the best we can, do some sharing in your table at first, but I think we will have some time to open up to the large group. So if sharing feels comfortable, feel free to turn to a neighbor. And I forgot, I think we skipped the part where you're supposed to introduce yourself. <laughs> So you can start with that if you'd like. Um, but yeah, do a little sharing at your table. You've got journals. If you want to just make some notes for yourself online, folks, feel free to chat in. Amna will help moderate that. And then we'll come back to the large group and just touch on these things, your personal experiences, what you saw in the video that either really felt familiar or things that didn't quite um, feel familiar. And then we'll move into some tips for handling menopausal symptoms. So take a couple minutes and we'll come back to the large group. If there's questions or comments, just raise your hand and Ashley will come by with the microphone. Oh, 
Oh, yes. Here, we've got a comment, please. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if you will touch this um, later uh, sections. I have questions about joint pains from uh, adjuvant treatments, um, how to deal with it, if there's any new medications to help with it. Yes. Is that, Ashley, is that in the late and long-term effects? I do have some pain to talk about yep. in there. Yeah. Yep. Great. Great question. And I think we also forgot to mention, sorry, the all the slides are available in your packet on the left-hand side. So if you want to take notes. Um, but yeah, great. Thank you. Anything in the online chat? Nope. Other comments or questions, you guys, just thank you so much already for the energy. I love that you're here interacting with each other. So we really appreciate your willingness to share. So now we are gonna move into some of those tips regarding managing the menopausal symptoms. So as we heard in the video, there's certainly a lot of medic, well, there are some medications that are available for management of menopausal symptoms. I'm not gonna read through these. Certainly you can work with your physician or your care team about um, management of symptoms and we also heard that in the video as well that you're bringing up these and bringing these comments forward um, to your care team so that they we because there are some medicate medical options that we can um, offer to patients certainly we know for those that are on tamoxifen there are some interactions so again making sure you're talking with your provider about any potential drug interactions and we do have the comment here that you're using non-hormonal contraception when you're taking um, tamoxifen so now we're going to move into some complementary therapies and just to give a little bit of definition and context Complementary, integrative, those are both terms that are used to describe therapies that are, are pursued in addition to standard therapy. So you're receiving your medical treatment through your physician and your care team. Complementary and or integrative, those are in addition to. Alternative, in contrast, those would be medication or those would be treatment options that are outside of standard therapy. So just to kind of lay that um, groundwork, we will not be talking about alternative therapies. These are going to be those additional treatments that you might be pursuing in addition to your standard treatment. And of course, we see here that you're always going to be discussing these things with your provider. We know, um, and maybe, uh, maybe I'll See a show of hands now. Have, have any of you um, thought about pursuing these? Are you pursuing these presently? Yeah, and have you had those conversations with your care team? We know sometimes providers don't always ask as they should, but it also is a very important part of your quality of life, your quality of wellness, your own definition of wellness. So we encourage that as you're able to bring these to the attention to your physicians, because partly in terms of um, the research and how we evolve medicine, you know, we need to know what folks are also pursuing uh, on their own wellness side. So we really encourage that you bring these conversations up to your team. And so we'll go through each of these here. Um, we are gonna start out talking about exercise. We're gonna talk a lot about exercise today. And we heard in the video, um, just uh, if there is one thing you can do for your quality of life and not symptom specific in this, in this context, but anything you can do to help improve that quality of life, reduction of symptoms that you're do that you're experiencing it really is about moving your body and i know exercise even can be a trigger word for folks but it's really about moving your body doing things that help you feel better and we can see the benefits here muscle strength flexibility um, reducing fatigue, increasing that quality of life. So we'll have some opportunity again through the slides. And then we've got our cancer rehabilitation folks that are gonna be here in the afternoon for some additional discussion. Um, but just a real plug here for that ongoing movement. Um, exercise itself, so specifically to uh, easing those menopausal symptoms of either hot flashes and or anxiety, the target for women uh, breast cancer uh, who are being treated for breast cancer or are breast cancer survivors is actually the same for general population. So really encouraging if you can 
30 minutes of exercise five times a day. So for a total of 150, I'm, I see. Oh, what did I say something? Whatever I said, yeah, that five times a day. Sorry, read the slide, yep. If you're in that mo if you're in that low intensity um, or to moderate intensity, or if you're in vigorous, then it's at the 75 minute. And we'll have some examples later in the slides as well for which uh, which exercises fall into those categories. And we can see here that yoga specifically does have some benefit to uh, menopausal symptoms. So here are a couple of poses. Um, seated wide angle can be used for heavy bleeding. Warrior two can be used to increase energy. And the reclining bound angle, that can help by calming the adrenal glands and, and regulating hormonal balance. For each of these, the uh, suggestion is to do the position for about one to two minutes and using that deep breathing during that time period. Two more options here are reclining twist pose, and that also helps decrease anxiety by reducing blood flow to kidneys and adrenals. Here, again, you would hold that one minute or so and then twist to the other side. And then legs up the wall is a great strategy prior to bed. It helps increase um, uh, relaxation, decrease anxiety, and then uh, help help with calming the body down. So the recommendation for this is holding three to five minutes prior to bed to help promote sleep. Any other questions about yoga? Have folks done some yoga as a way to encourage their their wellness? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Gilda's Club actually offers yoga classes and that's how I started. I did yoga. I went to Gilda's Club and did the classes there and now I'm happy to do that. So um, <laughs> highly recommend that. Great. There you go, a little plug. Great, yeah, thank you. So for nutritional supplements, um, certainly we're gonna be watching for any drugs that mimic estrogen, making sure again that you're familiar with what products you're talking about or that you're considering talking through those with your provider and that includes vitamins, any additional vitamin supplements that you're taking, any of those, um, trademark products that you can see listed on the slide. Again, really need to make sure you're uh, having those discussions with your provider before pursuing those. Aromatherapy, this is the use of essential oils um, that are extracted from natural plants, flowers, stems, leaves, etc., and either then use for inhalation or um, application onto the skin. Of course, we want to be aware that potentially applying to the skin could cause some irritation, but with the intent of creating some relaxation, could be relief from anxiety or depression, um, improvements in sleep, and reduce menopausal symptoms. This is a screenshot from the, uh, the Center of Spirituality and Healing here at the University of Minnesota. There's a, and this should be on your resource page, but we've got a great um, tab on its own. It's called Taking Care of Your Survivorship. And it's got a lot of these um, integrative therapies and some introductory information on there. Here, I just grabbed a screenshot of the page on aromatherapy, and you can see in the smaller print, it even goes through some specific um, different kinds of oils and what benefit they might have to you. So if you've got a desire to learn some more about integrative or um, aromatherapy, here's a great place where you can start that uh, learning. Of course, just with uh, previous with the nutrition supplements that we do know um, these are not regulated by the FDA. So you want to make sure you're selecting products that are um, safe, you know, do the investigating of quality of product. Certainly there may be risk for um, uh, skin sensitivity and or reaction when applied topically but there is there is some effective research studies around use of aromatherapy specifically to menopausal symptoms so again um, explore but use it cautiously and making sure you're following some um, noted research studies and again not um, 
webpage there will provide you some guidance on where to begin. Acupuncture is another option for reduction of menopausal symptoms. And acupuncture is the stimulation of pressure points through insertions of small needles into the skin. Again, we do have some research indicating that it is supported um, or it is helpful in reducing menopausal symptoms and it can be safe for women with a history of breast cancer, certainly wanting to avoid the affected side. Um, we do know also insurance can be difficult for paying for, and so costs associated with this can be difficult. There are some community practices, um, sometimes group community practices are more affordable. Um, also on that webpage, that Center for Spirituality and Healing, there's a link to uh, where you can find um, acupuncture certified providers in the state of Minnesota. So that's, you know, making sure you find a, an appropriate, uh, appropriately credentialed provider. Any comments or questions about acupuncture? Yeah. I, just, I went to acupuncture for the first time last week for my joint pain. My ankle was so bad. A world of difference. Oh, amazing. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it great. So much. I, I was actually able to go on a walk and I haven't been able to do that. Great, yes. great, good for you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've had acupuncture uh, following uh, a hip replacement and then a leg break. And uh, for pain, I think maybe they thought anxiety, but I'm, I'm never anxious. <laughs> uh, oh, I apologize, online people. I've had acupuncture in a, a treatment facility uh, following a hip replacement and then my leg broke the next day. Mm. So I had an extended stay in the hospital with a lot of that pain coming and it really does work. Ah. And uh, they come, you know, with needles, but it's like, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. It's easy mm -hmm. and it works. Great, yes, thank you. Um, relaxation is also, a. Uh, uh, Complementary or integrative therapy that can be very useful for helping uh, reduce those menopausal symptoms. And this is, you know, conscious mind focusing to go through the body and relax the muscles. Certainly, there's a lot of apps available on both Android as well as Apple products, knowing some are free, some are not free, some have ads. So just um, look look if you're considering it and i do want to call out we've got a little light bulb up at the top of some of these slides we also host the thrive series and the survivorship conference and what what that offers is um hour-long talks on topics specific to cancer survivorship. So when you see that little light bulb, know that we have some pre-recorded content and it can be found on our survivorship.umn.edu webpage. And we've got hours, like 30, 40, maybe even 50 hours of content. Great, phenomenal topics, but where you can just learn a little bit more. We know that some of this is, we're going through this pretty fast today, but we've got lots of additional resources available for you. And cognitive behavioral therapy. So this is where you're talking with a therapist, generally a psychologist, about um, the experience that you're having. And this has also been shown to reduce hot flashes and night sweats. There's some benefit for increasing interest in sexual activity as well as improvements in um, quality of life. And we did hear there, um, he mentioned hypnosis in the video and just want to call out that there's not a lot of great supporting evidence around hypnosis itself as a modality, but the behavioral therapy uh, with a therapist has, have, has been shown to be effective for women. Lastly, there's two other treatments that's taking over the world, <laughs> right? Um, but we do need to say CBD, there is not any evidence right now around supporting for menopausal symptoms. Um, but certainly we know there's no end in sight for some of these products and then mer medical marijuana as well. We know that's becoming legal. Um, and actually another note here about the joint pain, there is here even at the University of Minnesota, we've got a study ongoing around topical um, 
cannabis for improving joint pains as well. So there, and that's kind of where this, all of the, uh, the other treatments are. We just need more research so we can fully say that it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, impactful for symptoms. So in summary, we've talked, we've touched on, um, the fact that, uh, menopause can indeed impact your quality of life, and you all know this much more than I. There are some treatments available, so most importantly, we want to make sure if you're having these symptoms, we know they can really be impactful, that you're bringing them forward to your providers and that you're working on a plan um, that works for you. And then we do have some knowledge that pregnancy can be safe for you after diagnosis, although fertility may be impacted so that you're having those conversations as well with your provider. Um, any questions? And that's the end of section one. So that's, this is how it's gonna go. Um, yeah, are there any questions online or any comments here? Okay. Yeah, please. That I found medical cannabis to be really helpful um, during my treatment, both for nausea, anxiety, also helped with joint pain, surprisingly. Um, and, and, you know, I feel like we need to get away from the stigma associated with this medicine. Uh, and then just also add with the recent legalization, there used to be a $200 a year fee just for the privilege of being able to get your mm. prescription filled um, in the state of Minnesota. And with the recent legalization, that fee has gone away. So you can get with your oncologist as an option. You don't have to smoke it. I take a little pill you know basically um and there's low dose you know that you can start low in any way i just wanted to throw that out just so everybody is aware of this as an option for you uh with your side effects helpful with menopause too so just just an fyi mm -hmm. we have one question online are there any resources for yoga classes that um, anyone can share that are affordable or free i know Okay. There is a plug for Gilda's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gilda's plug. Okay. Oh. And here, give her the yeah. mic, Ashley. Thank you. Sorry. Gilda's oh. Yeah, the yoga classes at Gilda's Club are free, um, but they there's only eight people in this small room, so they fill up pretty quickly. So uh, you know, keep an eye on the schedule, and when they release the classes, then sign up. But it's yeah. fabulous. Come see the Gilda's Club team at their yeah. table <laughs> out in the. <laughs> Um, I'll add for an online yoga class, if you want to do it in the comfort of your own home, uh, Boho Beautiful, they're on YouTube. They also have an app, but they're really great videos. It's not geared specifically towards people with best breast cancer, um, but really good. The lady's Gumby, I can't do what she does, but uh, good Boho Beautiful. Yeah, and yoga, Adrienne, she's yeah. another, I, she's my friend, right? <laughs> I can also just share for the people online since they aren't here to see the vendors, but we just learned about survivaltostrength.com and they offer personal and group strength training for free for anyone who's had cancer. Yeah, yeah, and they'll be leading our yoga session at the break here. So yeah, thanks for that plug. Yeah, Ellen, did you have? Um, so a couple other things to mention. So I know Kaya had already uh, talked about the resources that are available through Fairview. There are a number of pre-recorded yoga videos that are also available yeah. on the spirituality website. Mm -hmm. um, Pathways is also a really wonderful, uh, not um, no cost uh, option for a number of complementary therapies. I believe that they still have some yoga, yoga, <laughs> yoga, uh, yoga options available there too. So just a couple other things to think about. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. We will move now to section two. So again, if you need a if you need a quick break here, go ahead and take it. Um, otherwise, we'll let Ashley come on to the podium.
All right, I think most people are back. We'll get started with our next section here. So again, I'm Ashley. I'm an oncology case manager and breast navigator out of M Health Fairview, uh, Wyoming location. Um, and this next section we're going to talk about is managing the long-term side effects of breast cancer treatment. So by the end of this section, we want you to understand that side effects of breast cancer treatment may last years after your treatment ends. You want to make sure you're learning new strategies to manage the long-term side effects, know what symptoms to watch for and what to report to your provider, and learn how to help your loved ones develop a better understanding of these effects as well. So to start this section, we're going to talk about kind of the standard follow-up guidelines 
Um, so initially your provider visits are every three to six months and then the longer you get from diagnosis the um, less often you'll see your team. At five years it typically goes to annual visits and some at that point um, will transition to primary care. Um, mammograms are routinely done uh, initially six months after a lumpectomy and then annually thereafter. And then mastectomies, if you had a mastectomy, the mammogram will be done on the unaffected side and no imaging is done on the mastectomy side if you just had it on one side. We, they do recommend pelvic exams annually if you're on tamoxifen, postmenopausal, and have an intact uterus. Um, and if you ever have any bleeding after menopause, you want to report that to your care team. They do do breast MRIs annually, but only for our high risk patients with germline genetic mutations, dense breasts or other high risk features. So again, these are standard guidelines and your treatment uh, may be individualized depending on what your provider uh, wants you to do. So bone density or DEXA scans, um, these are done to check for bone thinning for our postmenopausal women that are on any aromatase inhibitors like anastrozole, exemestane, or letrozole. Um, so this is usually done as a baseline, either before starting or shortly thereafter, and then they do them every one to two years after that. Um, other tests like tumor markers or other imaging is not a standard part of follow-up care, but if you ever have any symptoms or signs that suggest cancers, your provider may order some additional imaging at that point. So this slide shows all that we are going to cover in this section. Um, it is probably fair to say that everyone attending has experienced one or more of these effects. When we don't want to this to be overwhelming or raise any alarm bells as you may not experience all of these but we want you to have some useful information on what you can do if you experience these and hope you leave here today with some more resources to use so calling your healthcare provider so if you ever have any rapid weight gain uncontrolled vomiting severe headache uncontrolled pain chest pain anything like that that would be an emergent call to your clinic or visit to the emergency room. And then if you ever have any symptom that's bothering you for more than two to three weeks, that's not relieved by medicine or rest or any unintentional weight loss that happens over a few weeks, then you would uh, let your healthcare team know at the next, when they're next open. Uh, another thing to note about these long-term effects is that your provider may not ask you about each of these symptoms each time you go in, especially the longer you get out in your surveillance period. So if there's anything um, that's important, or it's important for you to bring up anything, especially when it's impacting your quality of life. So you can revisit that. Well, starting with fear of recurrence. So this is the fear of your cancer coming back. It's one of the most common worries. Um, it can have a powerful in impact on your quality of life. So things you can try, we want you to recognize these emotions, talk about your fears, journal, discuss with loved ones. We don't want you to ignore your fears. We don't want you to worry alone. There's our support groups that can be helpful. And then trying to reduce stress by spending time with family and friends, taking a walk or doing things that you enjoy. Some additional tips for coping with fear of reoccurrence are to be well informed, know what symptoms to report to your provider, talking with your healthcare provider, staying connected, attending your scheduled visits, making healthy choices, eating nutritious meals, exercising regularly, getting plenty of sleep, and avoid smoking and excessive drinking. So some of those signs to um, watch for would be changes in the skin that can be in both the breast or chest wall and then any new lumps dimpling or um, nipple discharge any lump or pain in the axilla or neck and then any symptom that seems unusual definitely report that to your provider so you guys know your bodies you're the ones doing your more routine breast exam so if anything comes up i would report that they can get you in get you seen and do any further follow-up that's needed um, and if it's you know a scarring or a cyst or something that comes up they can evaluate that and kind of uh, alleviate your worry 
So we talked about uh, the bone scans earlier, but this is a little section on bone health. So the bone scans are done for those postmenopausal women on AIs, but things we can all do to prevent bone loss is to eat a diet rich in calcium and vitamin D. Um, that can be green leafy vegetables, cereal, breads, low fat milk, things like that. Some people may need a supplemental calcium or vitamin D. And then, so there's a standard dose up here. You can always start with that and then check with your provider to see if that's appropriate or if you should be taking more. And then exercise, again, is huge to prevent bone loss and living a healthy lifestyle. We do have a short video here on breast cancer and bone health. For young women who don't have breast cancer, I think the bones are taken for granted. But once a woman enters the realm of breast cancer, she has to think about her bones because a lot, almost all of the therapies that we tend to recommend for the treatment of breast cancer can have negative impact on her bone density. Early loss of estrogen is a risk factor. A family history of what we call um, fragility fractures. Women who don't get adequate amounts of calcium and vitamin D, um, you know, that would be a risk factor if you don't get enough in your diet and you don't supplement. Chemotherapy can put a woman into early menopause. The loss of estrogen removes what is the fundamental supporting hormone to our bones. I am also BRCA positive, so I also had to have my ovaries removed. And lack of estrogen affects your bone health. We didn't want me being a crippled old woman at the age of 40, you know, so we, we had to start addressing that immediately. Typical test that we would use is a test of bone density called a DEXA scan. It's a pretty simple test to do. We do uh, what we call a plain film, a simple um, x-ray without a lot of radiation exposure of the spine, the lumbar spine, the lower spine, and then usually we do both hips. When I had the bone density test, I was very nervous going into it but it is probably the easiest scan you could ever get. Take a couple of pictures of my insides and I'm good to go. We get a score out of it. We get a Z score, um, which compares you to other women your age, and a T score, which compares you to a 25 year old who has you know, the strongest bones in her life. Uh, T score in the normal range tells us that she's got good bone density. And if it's below a certain level, she is beginning to develop the risk of loss of bone density. And if it's really low, then we actually give her a diagnosis of osteoporosis. When I had the scans done, the bone density scans done, um, I, it alerted me that I needed to definitely change my lifestyle. I started uh, consuming more natural foods that, con that contain calcium, not just taking calcium pills. Um, broccoli is like the superfood and calcium fortified orange juice. I try to get to the gym on a regular basis and I do a, an awful lot of running on an elliptical and a lot of weight training to help increase that. Exercise is so crucial for young women diagnosed with breast cancer and it goes so far beyond just the issue we're talking about right now of bone health, but it's also tremendous for bone health. All right. So next, talking about the heart. So research shows that there are risk factors for heart damage due to cancer therapy. There are certain chemotherapies that can have a potential to damage the heart, although it is rare. That would be adriamycin, pertuzumab, and trastuzumab. There are also radiation therapy to the left chest wall can damage coronary arteries, although this is rare as well. And then aromatase inhibitor therapy um, can increase lipids, which can result in plaque buildup. So other risk factors that may impact your risk of heart disease would be a body mass index of 30 or more, any family history of heart disease, current or previous smoker, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and getting older. So you can't change the treatment that you received, but what can you do to re reduce your cardiac risk? Again, exercise comes up uh, 150 minutes a week or the 75 minutes of high intensity exercise per week. And then if you smoke, um, it is highly recommended to stop smoking and there are resources for that. So pain, pain can be from any kind of breast surgery. It can be related to radiation and scarring. 
and it can be related to um, breast reconstruction as well on your implants. So things you can do to reduce pain, you want to discuss with your provider to rule out the causes. Um, physical therapy, cancer rehab um, is a referral we can place. Uh, relaxation, medication, and then if it's implants that's causing the pain, we would get you in with your plastic surgeon. Neuropathy. So neuropathy is pain or discomfort caused by damage to nerves that control movement and sensations in the arms and legs. There are certain chemotherapies that um, can cause this, such as carboplatin, cisplatin, uh, paclitaxel, docetaxel, cadcilla, and keytruda. Um, some of the signs and symptoms include numbness, pain, tingling, some loss of feeling in your hands and feet. Some people even have their hands feel cold. Um, and you can have mild to severe um, s s symptoms of this. Uh, some people continue to have the neuropathy even after treatment is finished, and we do see it to tend to get worse before it gets better, and that can be after completion of your treatment. Things to manage neuropathy, um, and discuss your symptoms with your provider, let them know how it's affecting your quality of life, it's affecting your sleep or walking around. There are multiple different medications, pain medications, creams, um, vitamin B6 is over the counter, that can help as well. Um, and then there are some lifestyle modifications to try. So avoid wearing tight-fitting clothing, wearing comfortable shoes, keeping your hands and feet warm, avoiding the overuse of limbs, and then using safety equipment. Some supportive care, um, again for this, acupuncture is another option, and then physical therapy. So fatigue is next, and that is very common side effect during treatment. Um, people continue to have this well after their treatment has ended, I mean, even up to six months or so. Uh, there's many things that can cause fatigue, so there's no specific medication for it. Uh, make sure you want to discuss this with our healthcare provider and describe the specific symptoms so we can get to the root of the problem. There are things that your provider may rule out, like anemia, depression, poor sleep, or metabolic disorders. But things that can help are staying active, staying positive, and getting plenty of rest. We have another video here. This is Amanda's story and how she copes with her side effects. I am a working mom. I own my own business, but I love to work out. I work out every morning and I allow that hour for myself just to work out. I don't check my email. I don't look at my phone. I just focus on the exercise and the time for myself. I use that time to forget what happened yesterday and move on with a new day. I'm Amanda. I was diagnosed with stage one breast cancer in September 2020, and I was 40 years old. I have not had a really great relationship with health and healthy eating and exercise. I really developed that more later in life. Having cancer definitely kind of opens my eyes to keeping myself healthy. The drug I'm taking right now is called tamoxifen. A lot of women have to take it post breast cancer. And unfortunately it does sometimes affect my working out. I you know, might be too sore one day to do certain type of workout, but I, I find that if I just push through it, I'm good. I feel like if I move my body, it makes me feel better. It kind of helps me just kind of recenter myself and figure out, okay, this is what I have now and I'm gonna rock it. I believe in mental health more than anything. Your mind's healthy, your body will be healthy too. After my breast cancer surgeries, I do suffer from a little bit of body dysmorphia. Like I don't recognize the body I'm in. Exercise makes me feel centered. Exercise makes me feel powerful. And exercise makes me feel healthy. I want women to understand that it's for every size, every shape. It really can make you feel better about yourself. Even if you're having a bad day or you're having a tough recovery day, you know, just put your arms up in the air for a few times, do some arm circles. We can all celebrate our bodies, no matter what they look like, and exercise is part of that. I am a working mom. 
All right, moving forward, we have weight gain. So this is a common side effect of cancer treatment, especially in women who stop having their periods. Um, chemotherapy actually changes the body's metabolism and how fat is burned. So there was a study that was done and it found that people who received chemotherapy were 65% more likely to gain weight than those who did not receive chemotherapy. So ways to manage weight gain, you know, talk to your provider about weight loss strategies that are safe for you. Exercise is important to increase metabolism. Weightlifting helps build muscle, which in turn burns fat. And then consider an organized weight loss program and see a dietitian for nutrition help. We will have a dietitian here today in the deep dive section as well. So cognitive problems or trouble with concentration, memory, multitasking are often referred to as chemo brain. And stress, anxiety, and depression seems to make these issues worse, especially in younger women. So we do have a few tips that can help with memory. Planning your day with to-dos or reminders on your phone, a to-do list. Um, and then if it's possible to do your difficult tasks earlier in the day, sometimes that can help. Uh, mind stimulating exercises like puzzles or word search. There's also some brain training apps on phones. Um, they're called like Lumosity or Elevate that can help with this as well. Getting plenty of rest. Some people find it helpful to use a pill box and then definitely asking friends and family for help when needed. And discuss these symptoms with your healthcare team. Lymphedema, that's buildup of fluid in the arm where the lymph nodes have been removed and there's a disruption of flow. So it's very commonly associated with any breast cancer treatment. And anyone who has lymph nodes removed is at risk and the more you have removed, uh, the greater you are uh, at risk. So it can occur anytime after treatment, even years later. And you can try to reduce your risk by maintaining a healthy weight and avoiding infection. And these are some symptoms you'd want to report to your provider. So the heaviness, swelling, aching of your arm, change in the way clothes fit, tightness of jewelry. And we'll also have a lymphedema therapist in our deep dive section this afternoon as well. So some women have benefited from wearing a compression sleeve for flying and then um, physical exercise. So helping loved ones understand uh, breast cancer treatment does not end on the last day of treatment. So we need to verbalize these changes to those that you love. Understand that the entire family can change from cancer experience. Um, we want to maintain open and ongoing communication. You may need to set limits on what you tell certain people. Have loved ones attend one of your appointments that goes over long care long-term effects so that they are aware as well and then consider counseling if any relationships are suffering. M Health Fairview does have a caregiver support group and then the caregivers are also able to schedule with our oncolo oncology psychologist so let us know if you need any more information on that. We have a little time here for table talk. So what supportive care services have been helpful for you in managing your side effects? So that can be any of our lymphedema, um, physical therapists, anything like that. And then are there anything you've learned that might be helpful to others to hear about regarding bringing questions forward and or tough conversations with either your loved ones or care team? So sometimes for the care team, it might be writing down questions for your appointment or sending my chart messages prior to your appointment to give them a heads up of what you're thinking and where you're at. So you can go ahead and take a few minutes to chat about that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Does anyone have any questions or comments for the group, or is there anything from the online? I would like to share something. Um, Hi. So going back when we were talking about the one of the first slides about the standard of care, mm -hmm. I just wanted to share um, a little bit of my story quickly. I was diagnosed in 2020. Um, with multifocal um, breast cancer and I had a single mastectomy. I was node negative with an Anka type of 23. I opted to do chemo. Um, I was not a candidate for radiation and then I was on tamoxifen. On a routine scan after celebrating three years of remission, they found three lymph nodes that live. I'm three weeks out, so I'm going to be okay. But that is, you need to advocate for yourself because when I went in last September for my mammogram, and I asked, please, can I have an ultrasound over here? And they said, well, you had a mastectomy. You don't need one. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I have two oncologists. And one was like, I'm giving you one every year. And he saved my life because I came out of surgery with eight nodes. So I, doing everything right, opting for chemo, being on tamoxifen with a 98% receptor you know, positive um, estrogen. I still had a reoccurrence. So it is everyone's fear. I'll tell you the fear really sucks for 15 minutes and then you're like, oh, I, I know this feeling, I'm gonna be okay. But advocate, if you don't like what you're getting, you have to advocate. If your doctor says no, go find another doctor. Yeah. Because you don't ever get to zero even with the mastectomy. That's all. <laughs> I have a question on on the advocating for yourself. Is there any information out there on Hashimoto's and breast care, uh, breast cancer? Because my doctor keeps saying it's no problem. They're different spots, so it's not going to be a complication. But all the symptoms from my Hashimoto are cold, hair loss, tired. Sure. So I'm curious if there's more information out there. Yeah, and I can I can have that question for Dr. Idosa too over lunch hour. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Since you are talking about the advocating, so I would also um, say that um, if you have drain, dense breasts, advocating to have a MRI in yeah. addition to mammogram is very important yeah. because I was diagnosed with mammogram because by then my cancer was four centimeter. So very easy to detect by mammogram. But initially they were going to do um, treatment based on that. And then uh, through MRI, they diagnose another tumor. Um, so advocating for MRI is very important for dense press. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to share a couple tips that I had experienced for um, some of these. I had all the symptoms, um, but for chemo brain specifically, learning a language helped, you know, reactivate some of my brain a little bit. And just like a super easy app of like Duolingo five, three, five minutes a day has really helped me um, with that. And then another thing I've dealt with was insomnia and getting early morning light in my eyes with like a walk in the morning and then again in the evening it felt like it reset my clock and like got me up for the day and then ready to like wind down at night so it helped with some of that insomnia i wanted to pass that on great thank you Um, I was just going to say um, I was referred to or someone told me about um, a physical therapist who specializes in, in like lymphedemia. Mm -hmm. Lymph lymphedemia. <laughs> Why can't I talk now? <laughs> and, um, and then I have a pretty in impressive cording that developed post-surgery and she has just made all the difference to be a resource as far as um, I, I don't have lymphedema, but I wear a sleeve preventatively from what my surgeon had told me and what she's told me. Um, but just like the massage, the exercising as I'm going through radiation right now. Um, so again, along the lines of advocating that may not be as high of a thing, but there are so many specialists that exist in different areas. So asking if you feel like that, because I feel like courting has been told to me that it's such a mystery and we don't really know exactly what it is but it is limiting and if you find someone who knows how to work with you with physical therapy it's been really helpful to me to feel supported so thank you So um, I have a lot of issues with brain fog, and um, I'm taking part in a study of um, that where they're trying to research women who've gone through chemotherapy and have brain fog so that they can help women down the road. And my phone isn't working, so I can't tell you what it is, but hopefully I'll get it working. If anyone wants to participate, they, they're giving $50 gift cards for Amazon every three months, and it's a mm -hmm. six-month process. But you know, to help other women down the road. So I just want to put that out there. Not to negate what Karen just said, but men have it too. So it's not just you females. So I have chemo brain, but I'm not on chemo. I'm on hormone therapy, metastatic breast cancer. And um, it just, bugs me that everything I read is women this, women that. I've even had radiologists give me back my report after I get my scan. Well, post hysterectomy, blah, 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 um, the right female breast. Well, I don't have a female breast. and In fact, I don't even have a breast. It's gone. So it just it gets old, and, um, and I know I'm only 1% of all of the, the breast cancers, but it just, um, I'm here to make people more aware before I start shouting at people. <laughs> Thank you. Good. All right, so wrapping this up in summary, late effects can affect, um, of treatment can occur even years down the road. Most of these can be, are rare. Be mindful of your body, report changes to your healthcare provider, and make sure you have open communication with your healthcare team and ask for help.
Any additional questions? Guys, we're gonna move into our movement break. Yes, so we've got Katie Plunkett here. She is from Survival to Strength, and she will work us through Strength to Survival. Can I say it wrong? Strength to Survival. Um, and she'll do um, our movement break here. This is optional, so certainly if you're um, feeling interested in it, she will lead you through the instruction. And then if you'd like to step out, the um, cafeteria area will just be open if you want to do some additional visiting, and there might be some of the vendor table spaces as well. So welcome, Katie. We're so thankful for you to be here. Good morning, everyone. Well, I am Katie Plunkett, and I um, am one of seven um, certified group operators that survive to strength. Wow, did not know it had to be so official. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're just going to hold this. So, um, anyway, um, Survival of Strength is a Twin Cities based nonprofit. And um, although we do serve people uh, throughout the state um, because we can do virtual sessions, so know that. Um, and um, we work with anyone of with who's experienced any type of cancer. So um, just know that in case you know of other people that have experienced other cancers. Um, uh, we know, you know, the toll that that cancer treatment can take on your body. And so um, our goal is to help you um, work with you to to help rebuild your strength, your coordination, your mobility, and ultimately your your self confidence. So. Um, so today, um, I'm going to just lead us through kind of a brief movement session and, um, you know, depending on your comfort level, you can stand, you can sit, you can be on the floor. Um, I'll just kind of do a little bit of both here, but, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, and I will give you, I'll give you options for movements of, you know, so that do whatever works best for your body. Okay. All right. Um, let me see if I can get this hooked in here. Okay, it won't. So, all right. <laughs> all right, let's start. Um, let's start with uh, just open hands, palms facing away. Okay, let's kind of extend those fingers out. Um, we all have kind of a resting position that tends to be a little bent. So extend those fingers out, out and we're just going to make fists and open up. Okay, just take your time. Might feel a few little crunches in, with your knuckles, but. Um, and then we're going to clasp our hands together and just slowly kind of do some um, wrist circles here. And trying to get all the way around lots of directions and change directions go the other way. All right, um, we're going to do, do a forearm stretch. And so um, uh, you can do this on your chair like this, on the table, or you can just use your other hand. Um, so the idea is to extend your arm out and um, just gently push down on your hand. Again, not forcing anything, but uh, we tend to hold a good amount of tension through our forearms. And so um, you can feel this typically um, through your fingers, right where, where the joints connect the fingers to the hand. Um, and again, all the way down your forearm. And whenever you're doing any kind of static stretch, you want to hold it for at least 30 seconds because inherently our, when we, when we try and stretch any muscle, um, our brain, and initially just tightens up that muscle and says it is as a protective response. So it takes about 30 seconds for the brain to tell that muscle it's okay, you can relax. So there is purpose in that. Let's switch to the other hand. Okay. 
like a room full of silence, huh? All right. All right, now um, we'll bring that back in. We're gonna interlace our fingers and then press forward. Looks like um, everyone is standing. So we'll press forward and you can either keep your arms here or you can bring them up if that's comfortable for your shoulders. Okay, and then we're gonna release those fingers and bend at the elbow. Okay, and just slide those elbows down toward your waist. So you should feel a good stretch across your chest. You should feel your shoulder blades coming together. Okay, and let's do that again. We'll inhale as we come up. And exhale as you slide down. Just think like there's you're standing against a wall. So you're really trying to use good posture straight, straight back. Okay, we'll do that again. And so I'm just going to do it if you're if it's not comfortable for you to bring your shoulder, your arms up and just bring your elbows back like this. Remember the breath. OK, and then uh, this time we'll do that same thing. Inhale and then exhale, but this time we're going to let our arms go wide. Okay. And let's turn our right palm up and our left palm down. Okay. So when you're standing um, like this, you want to make sure your feet are hip distance apart just so you feel grounded. Okay, so we're going to look at the right hand or the palm that's up and then we're going to flip them at the same time and look at the left. So this is allowing and just go back and forth here. This is allowing for um, shoulder rotation, but also um, we typically just move our head about 45 degrees. Think about it, you know, throughout your day. And so this just allows our our neck to move um, the whole full 180 degrees. All right. All right, now let's put our hands at our sides. And now we're going to slide down. So I want my, my ear to kind of follow my shoulder, but I'm not moving my whole body. So I'm not kicking that hip out. I'm just kind of sliding one arm down toward the side of my knee. Again, just do whatever is comfortable for you, but think about having your back against a wall so that you're not rounding forward, okay? And then we'll slowly come up and go to the other side. And back up. This is a good time to even just be aware of engaging your core, pulling Kind of your belly button in towards your spine so that again you're grounded through your base and over to the other side we'll do this one more time and now when we're on this side i want you to think about um, kind of drawing a diagonal line with your nose so looking down and then up to that um, opposite corner. Okay, just back and forth. Again, getting that full 180 degree rotation. <clears throat> and obviously, if anything isn't comfortable for you, um, you don't need to do it. And if you need some sort of modification, please let me know. One more time. All right, we'll slide back up and over to the other side. Same deal. Diagonal line with your nose. And we'll do it once more. And we'll come back up to center. All right, now we're gonna kind of stretch, lengthen our spine and stretch our um, latissimus dorsi, which are the muscles right here on the upper part of the side of your rib cage. So we're gonna extend both arms up and we're gonna reach with one hand a little bit more just toward the sky and then the other hand. You should feel a nice stretch all the way down toward your hip. And again.
So you can always inhale on one end as you're just about to start, and then exhale as you move to the other side. Okay. Now, if you're comfortable um, with doing this, come back to center, and then you can hold on to one wrist, and just again pulling it to the side, but you want to keep your back flat. And back to center, and switch, hold on to the other wrist, go the other way. And doing, you know, stretches like this, one really nice thing about it, we'll back to center and go to the first side, is that it um, helps you just be aware of sometimes, especially if you've had um, surgery, you know, that you know, one side might be quite a bit tighter than the other, and it just helps you increase that body awareness. All right, so we'll come on down here. All right, so now we're going to do a little uh, spinal mobility and kind of an upper back release. So. Um, I'm guessing some of you are familiar with cat and cow, their yoga moves, and so you can do it on the floor, on hands and knees, or um, standing or seated. So I'll do a little bit of standing and seated, okay? But what we're going to do is um, uh, we will um, kind of get almost in a huddle position. So your weight is in your heels and your hands are above your knees, okay? Your toes are a little wider than your heels. Okay, and we're going to inhale and kind of extend our chest out while keeping your core engaged so that you're not overarching your back. And then exhale and round your back like you're laying over a beach ball here, bringing your elbows kind of forward, looking toward the floor. And I want you to just let your breath guide you through this. So when you're ready to inhale, you'll open up. And when you're ready to exhale, You'll round. You should feel a nice stretch all the way down your spine. And again, just go at your pace. And I'm just going to move to the chair for a second because, you know, many of us do spend a lot of time if we're, you're working uh, at a desk. Um, you can do this on a chair as well. So I would just suggest that you sit kind of on the edge of your chair and don't worry what your coworker thinks of you, just kind of do this and next thing you know, they'll be doing it with you, so. a Couple more times here. All right, now just come up for a moment. You might wanna roll those shoulders back, uh, back and down a little bit. Okay, and then we're actually gonna go back into that position and do some shoulder drops. So what this is, is I'm back in that kind of um, huddle position and then I'm gonna drop one shoulder down and look away from that shoulder. So this allows for my spine, uh, my upper spine to twist a little bit. And we inhale as we come back to center and exhale as you drop the other shoulder in the opposite direction. You should feel, again, a good stretch across the front of your shoulder. Um, and just, again, let your breath guide you through here. But it's really important to keep your upper back kind of from bra line to the base of your neck um, mobile because um, as you're going about life, you know, you can, um, you need movement in your back. Um, to just reach down and grab something, unplug the vacuum, whatever it is, you know, cleaning out a garden or a yard or whatever. And um, if your upper back is super tight, then the movement will come from somewhere and typically it's the low back. And then we go, oh no, what happened here, right? And that just never, never feels good. So, so those are shoulder drops. Um, next up, uh, I'll stand up for this one. We're gonna do some arm slides. So, um, there's a couple ways you can do this. So if I'm just going to do it standing now, but you can do this laying on your side. Um, so we're going to extend our arms out, palms together, thumbs up. Okay. And I'm going to reach a little bit past one hand with the other and then slide that hand all the way down my arm, across my chest and behind me. Okay, you want to keep your neck in line with your spine, so you're probably not going to twist all the way back looking back, but 
you will a little bit and then retrace your steps all the way back to the front and we'll stay on that side reaching a little bit forward and then sliding all the way up and back now again this is for that thoracic spine and come back we'll do it again and back so it's really important when you're doing this that you are keeping your hips straight ahead so i'm not turning my whole body i'm just turning my upper spine here so uh, hips are still facing forward and back okay now let's go to the other hand so reaching forward sliding all the way up the arm across the chest and up and back and then coming forward so again you can do this laying on your side and I'd suggest that you kind of think about stacking your shoulders, stacking your hips, maybe bending the, the top knee, um, and, um, and then doing this slide, just extending your arms out, kind of if I were laying on the floor like this, and I would stand, extend out like this, okay? All right, so here we go. All right. So after all that, you probably want to do a little bit. I mean, it's, it's great movement for your back, but your shoulders can get kind of tight. So um, one thing to do is just think about there being kind of like a, a little marker on the end of your elbow, and you're going to do some circles on either side. Okay? Get those shoulders rolling around. And then we'll come the other direction. All right, let's see here. So um, next we're gonna uh, think about loosening up our hips a little bit, okay? Um, again, it can be a really tight area, especially if you are seated a lot during your day. Um, so you can do this seated or you can do it standing. Um, you might wanna hold on to a, the back of your chair, okay? So what you're gonna do is, again, start with your feet hip distance apart. Ground yourself through the leg that is closer to the chair, or um, you're going to be lifting up one foot. So the stabilizing leg, you're going to ground yourself through that foot, meaning weight is in your heel um, and your big toe. Okay, you're thinking about your posture here, so your shoulders are rolled back and down. Okay, you're going to engage your core, so pull it in toward your spine, and lift up the outside knee forward, bring it to the side, and down and out to the side, in and down. All right, I'm gonna do that five more times. Okay, just think like there's a little pot of flowers there and you're just trying to step over it. Oh. Right. In. All right, now um, we can just go to the other side and we'll do the other leg. So always ground yourself through this one, through the one leg. And this is a great way, uh, a great opportunity to practice balance. Okay, so um, you don't have to be holding on to anything. Okay, and lift that leg and out to the side and in. There you go. Pretty much all of these um, stretches are, the important thing is to just take your time with them. I think we live in such a fast paced world, we think we need to just one, two, three, go, and the slower you go, the more you'll get out of it. Okay, and last time. Now let's just stay on this side. We're still grounded through the one leg, and now we'll just do some gentle um, leg swings front to back, okay? So just going at, yeah, watch your neighbor, but um, uh, we're just going to go at whatever height your hip allows, okay? So just forward back, getting that movement going, okay? So as you kick back, you'll feel your glute engage. And it's a good stretch for the hamstring as you come forward, back of your thigh. Okay. 
And then we'll go do the other side. All right, leg swings on this side. All right. See, you could probably do this at your desk at work too. Okay, so um, now we're going to uh, stretch kind of our hamstrings and our calves, so the backs of our legs. So I'm gonna stand a little bit wider. Okay, um, again, toes a little wider than my heels. And I'm sorry, can you guys see me over there? It just occurred to me. Um, all right, so a little bit wider and we're going to lean in one direction and when I shift my hips over, I wanna make sure that my knee stays aligned with my laces, okay? So I don't want my, and I wanna be able to see my toe. So my weight is in my heel primarily and the outside of my foot, okay? So I'm coming to one side and then I can lift up the toe on the opposite leg, okay? So you should feel a stretch down that, at the leg of the toe that's elevated. Okay, and then come back to center and over to the other side. And it, just stick that bottom out in the back, like someone's pulling your tailbone back. And then up, back to center, and other side. Up, there we go. Up we go, we'll do one more time each side. And up. All right, back to center. So again, if you wanna hold on to your chair or the table, let's just do some ankle circles. So just think about drawing a circle with your toes there all the way around, trying to get as much movement as you can and then change direction. And then we can extend that foot out and point and flex. This is also, to, you know, not just great for um, kind of increasing blood flow and mobility, but um, it activates these muscles. So, you know, if, you're, if you've been sedentary, if you're not feeling like you have a lot of energy, this is just all so beneficial to just getting things moving and activated. All right, and then we'll switch to the other side. Okay, we'll do some ankle circles. Um, I can, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I just have to figure out how to, no, 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 I'm happy to do it. I just, um, actually when I started, I thought, oh, I should have had that for you guys. That would be good. All right, and point and flex, but yeah, I'm sure I can talk with the coordinator and then just maybe have it emailed out to you. Sure. All right, a couple more point and flex. All right, so um, now we'll do a little bit of a low back release, okay? We tend to carry some tension there as well. Again, you can do this standing or you can do it seated. So I'm just gonna start seated in case you want that option. Um, so uh, if you're a yogi at all, you might be familiar with forward fold, okay? Um, so that's essentially what we're doing. But again, if I'm seated, I'm gonna kind of be on the edge of the chair, keep my legs wide, um, and I'm kind of just going to slide down my legs toward the floor. So if, if, it's, if it's too far for you, then um, you can always have a pillow or something there so you're not feeling like you're straining. But the idea is to literally just slowly release, completely release your low back. So if I'm standing, I'm just letting the, um, my neck in line with my spine. So my head is just hanging. I'm not trying to look up at all. Okay, you should feel a stretch in your hamstrings, the backs of your thighs. And just take a couple of breaths here. When we're ready to come up, it's always important to bend your knees and put your hands kind of right above your knees on your thighs as you slowly roll up. Okay, you don't wanna use your back to stand up per se, you wanna use your legs. Okay, so um, let's see here. Um, just something to think about. Um, I may have mentioned it, but as you're sitting through all these fabulous se sessions, just be aware of your posture. You know, we all kind of are resting 
place seems to be kind of like this, right? So just think about rolling those shoulders back and down. You don't have to look like a soldier, but you know, you want to just um, keep these upper back muscles engaged. Um, otherwise, we can just get really tight through here. So um, that's something to think about. And then if you want to be seated, we're just going to kind of uh, wind down with like a little, uh, if you want to close your eyes, you're welcome to. Just get in whatever position is most comfortable for you. Okay, so if you'd like to, um, again, you don't have to close your eyes, but if you'd like to, if you feel like that helps you feel a little more centered, um, I just want you to notice your breath. So you don't have to do any certain kind of breathing can breathe in and out of your mouth, your nose, whatever works for you, but just notice your breathing, what it feels like as it enters your body and as you exhale. We're going to take kind of a, a just a momentary body scan here, starting at the top of our head. <clears throat> so I just want you to think like there's a, a very soft either water or blanket or whatever would be comfortable for you kind of going down your body. So starting at the top of your head, again, being aware of your breathing the whole time and just feel it trickle down gently over your eyes. Think about the muscle in between your eyes, around your eyes, or the top of your head down your cheekbones and your jaw, just releasing any, any tension that it bumps, bumps up against. Okay, going down your neck. Again, it's relaxed. And then we're guiding, heading down our shoulders. Okay, in the front and in the back, down your arms. Again, the front and the back of your arms, all the way to the tips of your fingers. You feel that gentleness on your palms. You feel it going down your mid back, all the way down your low back. Just pure relaxation. Over your chest and past your stomach. Down to your hips. And then it's going to slide down your thighs, the sides of your legs, your bottom, and the backs of your legs. And just continue to flow down over your calves, over your knees, down your shins, okay? over the tops and bottoms of your feet. Okay, You feel it covering each of your toes. You feel your arch be, arches being relaxed. And we'll just settle here for a moment. Being aware of your breathing. And we'll take one deep breath in and exhale. And again, and big exhale, get all that air out. Last time, inhale, feel those lungs expand and exhale. And gently kind of flutter your eyes open and we are done. And I want to thank all of you because it is truly an honor to be here today. So thank you guys. All right.
Good. I'll just give you a minute here and then we're going to move on with section three. All right, for this section, we're going to talk about sex and breast cancer. So by the end of this section, we want you to better understand the sex and intimacy changes that young women may experience. We want you to be empowered to discuss these concerns with your healthcare team, gain insight from others impacted by breast cancer, and understand that you're not alone, and there are many resources to help you. So we're going to start with a video here of Anna's story. At the time that I was diagnosed, I had actually gone through my very first boudoir photo shoot. And it's very kind of serendipitous looking back now because I have these images of my body pre-cancer. And I see this woman that was expecting a life that was gonna unfold that is very different than the one that unfolded. Before cancer, I had a very healthy sex life with my husband. And then during treatment, there was definitely a withdrawal and a lessening of that. I think the most difficult aspect was the sexual side effects and the sexual kind of ramifications of my treatment in the years to follow. It ranges everything from a lack of libido, a lack of desire for any kind of intimacy, all the way up to painful intercourse, uh, vaginal dryness and hot flashes, everything that kind of you would normally associate with menopause, except in a very young woman. I broached the topic with my oncologist when we started to see that it was getting more and more painful and it was truly having an impact on our ability to have sex or to be intimate on a regular basis. It was one of those doorknob questions with the doctor where we finished up everything else and they're leaving the room and I awkwardly at the very end say, oh, by the way, is there anything that can be done because I'm having difficulty with intercourse? And then it was in the coming weeks and months in being referred to a gynecological specialist, along with talking to other young women and older women in the community that had gone through similar impacts from their treatment of saying, oh yeah, there's options. One of those is the use of dilators. And this was something that was given to me by the gynecological doctor when I went in speaking about pain. And so from my Understanding from this doctor and learning more about the impact of hormone blocking medications on the vaginal areas that skin um, and muscle tissue can thin in that area, causing a lot of pain. And so there were various contraptions, like one strange bendy thing that I would use to, to stretch. And it was literally something that I was supposed to do every night for five minutes and the dilator use. Um, and it really did help. The other thing that has been extremely helpful for me in the past year or so is using a injectable moisturizer that's in a suppository form. And I put that in about five minutes before any kind of intimacy. And I have actually, for the first time since breast cancer, had sex that was not painful. And so for me, that is such a huge turning point. I think my views on sex before I had breast cancer were much more of a carefree, spontaneous expectation. It was the concept that in order to really truly have this great sexual intimacy, it has to be spur of the moment and it has to be enjoyable for everybody. And I think my mindset after cancer has shifted more to 
Sex is just one form of being intimate with your partner. And it's something that has to be prioritized and worked on. And I think for me, taking off the table this expectation that it has to be spontaneous or it has to be the spur of the moment thing or it has to be amazing every time has really kind of relieved some of that stress. So I think as I've maybe matured and as I've changed since treatment, I just approach it through a new lens. It's a part of our relationship, but it's not the sole part of our relationship. And it also goes hand in hand with how are we caring for each other in other romantic ways and how are we bonding and how are we finding time to talk and communicate and feel safe and trusted with each other and understanding that all of those parts and pieces fit together in your intimate relationship and you really can't have one without the other and so I think it's much more of a complex relationship for me now when it comes to my views on sex and intimacy but it's definitely one that has much more of a deeper core versus before it maybe being more of a surface level understanding. At the so we will take a few minutes for a table talk here where you guys can talk amongst yourself or share with the group if you um, are comfortable. But what different things did you learn watching the video? Have you had any similar or different experiences? Um, what changes have you experienced with breast cancer? Has it impacted your self-image, self-confidence and sense of attractiveness? And have you discussed these issues with your healthcare team? So we want to take a few minutes and share. I know. <laughs> I mean, it's All right, does anyone have anything they want to share with the group? Or Amna, do you have anything online? Good. Mostly on the on the body image thing. Um, I did tell my partner I was like, and I have a, a wonderful little nine year old not little at all, or almost <laughs> nine year old. And I, and they're very honest. And they're very like, Mom, you can wear a hat or don't wear a hat around the house. I don't care. Or or very like, as I've been losing my hair has been very fun to listen to them. And then I told my partner, I was like, Okay, Jonah can be as honest as they want. You have to lie. <laughs> you have to tell me that I look awesome. All the time. <laughs> and that has been really helpful. Like that, that wasn't normally me. Um, before this, like, I haven't really cared what I think or what cared what other people think about how I look. Um, but oh, wow, that came rushing in that I realized that I care about this, especially right now. And um, that has been helpful to our relationship. <laughs> sure. Thank you. 
Thank you. Great comment. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Ben? All right. So intimacy and sexuality. Breast cancer may change your sexual relationship, sexual health and function, and level of sexual satisfaction. So intimacy is the emotional connectedness or closeness with another person. And sexuality involves your feelings and beliefs about yourself as a sexual being. So you can have intimacy without sex and sex without intimacy. So there are many different side effects listed here from surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and hormonal therapy uh, that can affect your sexual health. And then what is normal? So breast cancer may affect your feelings about your sexuality. These changes may affect self-image, self-confidence, and sense of attractiveness. And of course, these changes impact your quality of life. So if you're having issues with intimacy because of a change in your body image, it is very, very common and normal. So this just kind of shows the side effects of cancer treatment, that it can affect your arousal or lubrication, libido. It can cause pain with penetration, lack of energy, and menopausal symptoms. So this talks about how the lack of estrogen actually impacts your sexual activity. So chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, ovarian suppression can all cause a decrease in the amount of estrogen and testosterone, testosterone circulating in the tissues. This lack of hormones causes a decrease in sex drive or libido, and the lack of estrogen changes the vaginal tissue, causing it to shrink and become dry. So these changes can lead to decreased lubrication and pain during sexual activity. Uh, body image. So body image is the picture of your body that you form in your mind. It's often very different from what others see. And your perception of your own body is impacted by many factors. That includes your emotions, your perception of beauty, identification with other people, and then accepted social norms. So having a positive body image improves the connection between partners and satisfaction with your intimate relationships. So some ways to improve your self image, um, you have to give yourself time, give yourself grace to adjust to the new you. Practice inner reflection, positive affirmation. You wanna focus on the positive strides and taking small steps. You can try meditation, guided imagery, you can journal, um, buying new comfortable lingerie that feels good um, to wear. Use your resources that are available. You can seek counseling if needed and then focus on the things that you can change. There's different stressors from treatment that can impact your intimacy like finances, role changes, physical, emotional impacts and anxiety. But communication is going to be key. So being open and honest about your fears, desires, and pleasures, and explore your, your val explore and validate your partners as well. It's best if you can do this face-to-face. -face. Um, if not, you can journal, you can write letters to each other, whatever's most comfortable or feels safe. And then there's also the option for individual or couples therapy as well. So things to try to improve your sexual health with your partner would be sexual stimulation without penetration. So different sexual positions that reduce pain, lubricants, moisturizers, and then again, the open communication. So different things a provider can do. They can prescribe vaginal dilators. They can prescribe topical or vaginal estrogen. They can refer you to a sex therapist. They can refer you for vaginal laser therapy, physical therapy for pelvic floor relaxation, and then a counselor for the therapy. Yeah. Uh, just the present, I know estrogen allowed. I, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, you mentioned here uh, vaginal estrogen. I, I thought that was not allowed. Yeah, so it does depend on your case. There may be a low dose that they'll allow you to, but um, you would have to check with your provider. And Tara, this afternoon, will 
have a great answer for you as well and we'll probably go into that in depth. So you have this guide in your folder. It's actually called Cancer in the Bedroom, a little packet. So Tara, that's gonna be here this afternoon. Um, Physician's assistant with M Health Fairview is one of the creators of this booklet and she's gonna be leading a breakout session. So if you wanna take a few minutes and flip through there and see if there's any helpful or new information for you, see if you've tried any of the things and let us know if you have any comments or anything you'd like to share. Yeah. Just a quick question in regards to the vaginal laser therapy, Mona Lisa touch. <laughs> like, um, I, I'm just curious, like, what is that? <laughs> and um, would it be covered by insurance? <laughs> okay, that's all the things. I probably, I, I know it's like laser therapy. It's a frequency that they um, give to those muscles. I am not sure on the insurance part and Tara may have more on that as well. Dr. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Do you have a question online? What brands of vaginal moisturizers and lubes do you recommend? Yeah, so uh, there are some listed. So Replens, Astroglide, KY Intrigue, Vitamin E, and then Good Clean Love. I know we do have a basket of samples out front as well, and we'll bring them in here for the breakout session too. And then one of the handouts in the packet that I think will be available online, there's a lot of great um, resource examples for that. Any other comments, anything? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the vitamin E, is it taking orally or is there application? Vitamin E, did I say vitamin E? Oh, it, it is a, it can be orally. They're, they do have a, a gel, but I think it's an oral thing, but I can verify that with Tara too. All right, so we do have another video. So this video is more geared to the population that's dating or thinking about dating if they're not in an established relationship. We'll watch her story. I was 24 at the time I was diagnosed and that's when online dating really came out. So it was a lot of swiping and online dating, a lot of casual sex, you know, obviously safe casual sex, but a lot of, you know, just being young and having a good time. Being so young and being faced with morbidity and, you know, being a cancer survivor makes you weirder, um, darker and harder to relate to. Um, and that's definitely, that's definitely the case. You know, I'm not the same person that I was. I'm not the super cheerful type A, super energetic person I was when I was 24, 25. My cancer experience definitely had a huge, huge impact. While I was like horny and like I did want to have sex, it was just too painful. And then, you know, I have a very different body. I was very confident in my body before all these surgeries and treatments. It's taken a huge hit on my self-confidence and my body and my ability to want to meet people. You kind of have to apprise someone before you take your shirt off um, that you have um, a weird body and you have unnatural breasts and you don't have nipples. I want a partner that will support me and, and help me and hold my hand through this journey, you know, who will help me rediscover my body again. There are billions of people on this earth. The, it's, it's pretty much impossible for you to be alone. And it's really easy to feel that way and convince yourself of that. It's something that I still struggle with every single day. Um, but you're not, you know, and if someone's not talking about something and it's something that you're experiencing, 
it is a, it's not even a maybe, it is a guarantee that somebody else is going, is experiencing what you're experiencing, but they don't feel comfortable talking about it. They don't know how to talk about it. They don't know how to bring it up or navigate a conversation. So um, you can try to start the conversation and they might not feel comfortable talking about it and that's fine. But a big part of it is just letting people know that they aren't, they aren't alone. All right, so a few things on dating after breast cancer. Uh, the idea of dating may make you nervous or cautious, curious. Of course, there's no right time to tell someone that you're dating about your diagnosis. You don't need to tell everything about your life and health history right away. Trust your judgment on when it feels right for you and try to have these conversations before you're ready to become sexually intimate. Dating is stressful for everyone, so we have to remember that our potential partners may also have a story or health histories and as well that they're going to share. So contraception, pregnancy is not advised while on chemotherapy. It's also not advised while on tamoxifen treatment. Um, the effective contraception is critical. Avoiding any contraception with estrogen or progesterone if your cancer was ER positive. And then also if your cancer was triple negative, you wanna avoid it for the first five years. Of course, there's different ways around all of this. So will have to talk to your provider about your individual uh, contraception options. So in summary, as a young person with breast cancer, you may experience lots of changes in your sex life and intimacy, and this is normal. You are not alone. You want to learn from others living with breast cancer, communicate with your partner, and feel empowered to talk with your health care provider. Just there are a few local resources. We have Tara here today. And she'll talk about some of these as well, and then there's the Thrive Series video too. And we'll put a plug in for that smitten kitten. It was up there. Has anybody been to that store? Alan, maybe you, um, but anybody specifically know about that or want to tell about? Yeah, go ahead. It, it was years ago, but what I really liked having gone to other, like whatever sex, you know, stores, I don't know what you call them, but smitten kitten, I believe it's lesbian owned. I could be wrong. Um, but uh, what I liked about it is it took away like, you know, like all these overly, like, like it's almost like they are marketed to men, like even though it's a vibrator that a woman would most likely use, um, you know, with these overly sexualized women on the cover, they, they took away that piece of it. So it's more like, okay, like, let's look at this from a, a maybe a female perspective or um, somebody who identifies as female let's not objectify women in the process of marketing these products you know what i'm saying so um that's what i remember about it yeah yeah i know they're um really customer oriented as well so they do one-on-one -on -one teachings and trainings, um, individual appointment sessions, if you can't make it during store hours. They're in Minneapolis. Um, and Ellen, is there, do you, do you have anything else to add about how they operate, but just a phenomenal local resource? Yeah, I think, I mean, I had a very similar experience. Do um, Incredibly welcoming. And I feel like the message of just like, uh, positive connection with yourself and self-love is such an important part of that we're bringing into our most intimate relationships too. Um, they've got a ton of resources. They have resources specific for um, sex and cancer that are there that you can buy and read and or other things you can audibly listen to, but highly, highly recommend. Yeah. Any additional questions? That's the end of this section before we move on to the final one. All 
All right, good. We are in the home stretch. Oh, one comment. Sorry. <laughs> So my table mates encouraged me to tell a story because I told it to them. So I thought I'd share with the rest of you in uh, the spirit of motivation. Um, I was diagnosed in August, uh, second time in my life. And um, I went on a match date after my lumpectomy and before my radiation therapy. And I said, well, it's just coffee, right? Um, and it was just coffee, uh, but it's turned into a five month relationship. Um, and you know, it was a whole question of when to disclose. Um, and so I did not disclose at coffee, but when I was then um, asked to go to dinner, I said, let's talk. Um, and I explained where I was in the process and what I've been through and what I have survived already, uh, 18 years. So, um, and his response was, that doesn't scare me. He said, that's this much of who you are. I'm interested in this part, right? And so it, was scary as all get out, um, but worth every piece of anxiety. And I have a lot of anxiety, as you can tell, I don't like to talk in public, but <laughs> just, you know, be brave, do something that is a little scary and it may really pay off. So good luck with your dating initiatives. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you all. We are in the home stretch. This is our last section. Um, f lunch follows. So hang with us here for this last part. So this is really the focus on self care. And we know so much of this might be um, you're actively involved in this every single day. So we don't want to dismiss what you are have in place already. But just to thank you for everything you're doing for yourselves. And maybe you might le learn a couple more tips along the way here. So we're going to talk about genetic health, we're going to talk about additional cancer screenings, talk again about exercise, nutrition, and healthy habits, and then a little touch on mental health, which even when I say little, I don't like how much little there is in here because we know that's so important through all of this, um, but we will spend a couple of slides talking about that. So genetic health, have, did everybody here have opportunity to talk with a genetic counselor or genetic testing? Good. If not, we, we need to get you to do that. Um, but it's really become standard of care that so much is impacted by genetic health and with the technology, everybody should be having that opportunity. We know that mutation status can impact the treatment decisions, other cancer screening um, impacts for your uh, family, family members, as well as then what your follow up recommendations were um, or will be. And if you had testing prior to 2017, that it's now time to get retested or re um, look, have that conversation with your provider about what might be appropriate for you. So these are the gene mutations that are known to be associated with uh, breast cancer. And as we said earlier, this is both about your future as well as uh, any relatives for breast cancer and then any other potential cancers. Does anybody want to share a story about their genetic experience? Yeah, great. <laughs> Don't want to hog the microphone. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, diagnosed 18 years ago, I did the genetic testing back then, and I was a negative for BRCA. Um, and so I went on with my life and uh, was very happy about that. And, uh, and uh, this time around, I had genetic testing again, and I do have the check to gene. Mm -hmm. So um, do retest if, if you did it a long time ago. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was tested um, right after I was diagnosed, but it went through my insurance before I was tested and it was denied. Mm -hmm. They said, you've already got breast cancer. And I said, but I've only got it in one breast. I need to know if I have it. So I decided about a double vasectomy. You have the right to appeal. Mm -hmm. If your insurance company denies you for the, the testing, appeal it. And that lovely lady over there helped me with, <laughs> with the whole appeal process with my, with my insurance company. Mm -hmm. So just remember that you have those options. Don't accept no instantly. Yeah, great. Thank you for that advocacy. We heard that earlier. If you've been told once, don't accept it ever. <laughs> right? Other comments? Um, oh, yes, go ahead. I'm pretty open about it. I have, have BRCA2. My grandma had it. My aunt 
has had cancer. So I have been blessed with honestly a really open um, family history. So like when I walked into the genetic counseling appointment, I was like, this person had this cancer and this person had this cancer. I know not everyone has that, um, but not that my family talks a whole lot, but at least that I have been trying to continue um, that conversation for sure. Um, because some, you know, the way I'm dealing with my um, BRCA2 is very different than <laughs> other people in my family are dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the hardest part for me, though, the, the latest thing is I was on schedule to get a prophylactic <laughs> double mastectomy um, when they found cancer and um, kind of on the on the schedule. And my sister also has BRCA2 and it has been almost harder to me to know now, like my aunt had cancer at 55. So I was advised between 40 to 45. And now I am 40 and I have cancer and my sister is really impacted by that. So, and, and having those conversations with her have been, oh, sorry, <laughs> very hard because she's so young. She's 13 years younger than me and um, it's gonna be really different for her too. So mm -hmm. um, holding space for, for family members along the way too can be, helpful for yourself too. I think I've helped found, found it helpful mentally. Thank you. Yeah, such a great comment. Thank you for sharing your experience. And that's, it's, it's individual journey, but yet really so tied to familial journey as well. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just kind of following up on that as far as the family history one. Um, so I have pelvic 2 mutation. Um, I found out that I had it. That's how I found out I had cancer and my preventative, my first screening. Um, so knowing the family history definitely kind of, I think, saved me from being a lot further along. Um, but my genetic counselor recommended with all my reports, my genetic testing and everything, like starting a file now um, for my um, husband and my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, because we can't get her tested yet. Obviously, she's young, but having like the specific, not so there's no like, you know, um, word of mouth down the road. It's like she'll have the actual report, the data, um, and how important that is going to be down the road. Um, and then the other thing, um, uh, oh, I, that my genetic counselor was, is, recommending is meeting with her every year, even though we know what my mutation, you know, like my risks are and I have my oncology team and everyone else. But um, especially for like some of the other ones that like Pelby 2 which is a newer, you know, mm -hmm. not newer mutation, but less is known about it. Um, she said, she's like, you know what, the, the guidelines are going to change constantly. Mm -hmm. And she has some ideas based on just her experience of, you know, 30 years in of what other cancers might be impacted, but they're not official like yet. And so um, staying up on that too, I think is if you have any, you know, just the check-in, the yearly check-in to see what else I should be aware of, so. Yes, shout out to our genetic counseling yeah. partners, right? And, awesome. and just all the work they do to stay current and stay up to date, yes. Yes, hi, I have the BRCA1 gene and I think kind of through my journey, I had kind of found out a cousin had it. So then I was like, it was through my dad's family where there's a lot of men. And I think um, it's, I think through this process, this like you kind of look at, oh, my mother, my grandmother and all that, but just a reminder that it comes from your father as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, and just for my children too, I have a son and obviously it's gonna be different for him than my daughter, but um, just to kind of have that reminder out there, maybe they're not as affected, but they can still have issues, which my father did, you know, later on in life. But just to kind of for yourself too, when you're, I was trying to wait for my dad to get tested and that was taking forever. And um, so anyways. Yes, thank keep, you. Keep in mind the men also carry that gene. Thank you, yep. Excellent. Thank you. Great conversation. And so this this is a little bit of a shift in gears, but it actually follows up with the uh, most previous comment, uh, a survivorship care plan. So this is going to be when you're done with treatment, your care team um, should likely, and the point of this is to have that data, right? So there's a genetic testing in there, but the point of these survivorship care plans is to serve as a treatment summary so that as you're transitioning to um, different 
stages of your life, whether you're moving or you've got new primary care providers, if you want to share this with your family and other loved ones, it provides you this record of your history, um, provides you a guide for then what to expect next in terms of surveillance, future appointments, etc. There should also be tips in there around staying healthy. This is our example here at M Health Fairview. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but you can see as you move, this is two pages side by side. The diagnosis information is there, genetic or cancer risk assessment um, comes from the bottom of the page up to the next top. But so, you know, and then we'll put a date tested in there. So you've got that record as well as the result. And then moving into surveillance, that's uh, what you expect then in the next phase, at, you know, after you've completed that active treatment, what comes next for you. And then these are the last pages, some tips around what to report to your provider, what late and long-term effects that Ashley was speaking about earlier, what you can anticipate uh, as you move further out from treatment, and then um, some of the common concerns and potential supportive care resources that would be available to help you. And then we've got healthy tips on the right hand side. So if you are done with treatment, if you are getting close to treatment, keep this in mind because it really is a tool for yourself. It's for you and your primary care provider, your family members, just to have that all in a concise uh, space. So moving into cancer screenings, Ashley touched earlier on mammograms. Uh, we talked about, or the, I'm sorry, the breast cancer screening post-treatment, that lumpectomy will be six months uh, for mammogram, and then annually single mastectomy, you'll have yearly mammogram on the unaffected side. We heard also about the value of advocating if you note other changes, uh, and then breast MRI for those high risk patients, either with uh, genetic history, dense breasts, or other high risk features. Yes. Is that a question for later? What are other high risk features? Yeah. Great question. Yes, I know. When I saw these slides, I was like, oh, that's, okay. yeah, exactly. I think, but important that you know what your individual screening recommendation is. Yep. So make sure you're very clear when you're with your provider, what, what is the recommendation for how long? Yeah. And would you fall into a high risk? But yeah, absolutely. Say that for Dr. Dosa. Thank you. Um, skin care screening. So this is um, for your primary care and or a dermatologist. These are examples of um, abnormal looking moles. You can see A, B, C, D, E are the, um, are the, uh, uh, What's that called right there? The acronym, thank you, for, for what you're looking for. So if you draw a line through the mole, is it symmetrical? So that's what asymmetry would be. If it's not symmetrical, could be concerning. Border, if the border is uneven or scalloped, something you might want to be taking note of. Color, you want to have a uniform color through the mole. If it's got multiple colors in it, something also to bring to the attention of a provider. Diameter, larger than a pencil eraser, that's something you'd want to make note of. And evolving, so if it's growing over time. But really, I can say uh, dermatology, they use the language in their, in their um, survivorship care plans, that ugly duckling mole, right? Anything that just looks not like the other um, is something you you want to get checked out. Here are some tips for sun protection. Um, my guess is that most of this is familiar to you. Just want to call out specifically some drugs and medications are have sun sensitivity as a side effect. So making sure you're aware if you're taking any of those medications. And then again, making a plan for yourself that you're getting regular skin checks, whether it be with your primary care or a dermatologist. Colon cancer screening now is at age 45. That began in 2018. Um, it may be younger if you've got family history and or other high risk, other high risk features. Um, but again, making sure you are aware of where you should be in that schedule. And then it gets um, your subsequent testing is based on what the result of that first one was. And yes, that's a walk through colon if anybody's had <laughs> that opportunity. They're pretty amazing, actually. Um, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> 
ovarian cancer screening. So there is not a, a, a test specific for ovarian cancer screening. However, those with um, BRCA mutation may have um, CA125 is a blood test and or pelvic ultrasound. Um, again, for general population, there is not a screening tool, but this may be part of your care routine. Although cervical care or cervical cancer screening then is recommended for women uh, in the age 30 to 65 group, it's every five years with uh, HPV testing and then that phases out after age 65. So a little bit more on those self-care tips. So here is that table that I promised you later where it breaks into categories when we're talking about low intensity, moderate intensity, or high intensity. So again, we see that recommendation of at least 150 minutes per week or that 75 minutes per week if you're doing the high intensity. We also see a call out here for resistance exercise and or strength training uh, two times a week. Um, and then spreading it out if, if it, if it, if you prefer to spread it out, um, doing it in at least 10 minute intervals per day or at a time. So here are some tips. Um, if you are at a point where you're just, you don't know where to start or how to start or what you could do to start. We have mentioned earlier, cancer rehabilitation is a great option to get you um, uh, working with a physical therapist for a potential strengthening plan for yourself. But there's other ways just in your daily activity. How, you know, are you able to take the stairs? Are you able to park farther away? Are you able to do, um, walking in place while you're watching your TV shows, toe touches when you're doing your laundry, picking up pieces and doing a couple or burpees, working those in there. Um, any other people have, there's a mention here for apps. Anybody else have fun apps that they've, YouTube is a great resource for five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute, try to work them in. And the most important part is try to find something you enjoy, right? Like we we can stand up here all day long and talk to you about how to do this, but if it's not enjoyable and if it's not fun, that's it's not gonna work. But we believe in you, right? So nutrition, we have um, a deep drive later this afternoon with Janelle. So this is just gonna be a very uh, high level, but nutrition is important. Nutrition is important because it really can impact how you feel today, tomorrow and into the future, right? We've all had those heavy meals where you just feel like, ugh. And if you multiply that across your lifespan, right, it really does help you help you feel better each day. Um, and in combination with physical activity, you can uh, reduce your risk for other chronic diseases, as well as promote overall health and potentially your risk for breast cancer recurrence. So this slide, again, Janelle's got a great handout. I think it's in your packet specific to breast cancer diet suggestions, but this is that general overview of the healthy plate um, uh, layout, the number of servings that we're attempting to achieve each day. This will be online and is part of the LBBC resources, but again, um, Janelle will have opportunity to dialogue more about this in her session. Healthy habits. Um, Ashley talked a little bit about nicotine. If you are using nicotine and you need support, there's great resources out there. Individual health insurance plans, many of those offer support. If it's not covered, Minnesota Quit Plan, for those of you that live here in Minnesota, is a great free resource that uh, allows um, both coaching as well as medication support if you are ready to quit. Drinking less alcohol, and I know this, everybody maybe has an opinion about how much, how I'm not going to give you the, the um, medical advice, right? That was in our dis disclosure statement. I would say follow your doctor's advice here, but we know less is better, right? Like just if you can reduce your intake from alcohol 
you have less risk of potential recurrence. And then we again, we see CBD, THC use, uh, uh, not regulated presently by the FDA, so it's difficult to determine, although we've heard even today there can be benefit. People can have symptomatic control, better quality of life around this, so just making sure that you're talking with your healthcare team if you have questions about um, use as well as uh, potential interactions. So mental and spiritual health, as I alluded to earlier, we know how much impact there can be to just everyday or to disruption of life, to overall quality of emotional health and spiritual health. It changes everything. And while we just have a few slides dedicated here, we know it's so very important too. So we've got Ellen, she's going to be a social worker in um, our second half if and she can help address and point to some resources around this but knowing that shock anger denial and acceptance are all it changes by the moment some days right um if there is a need for a counselor know that we have resources available on um, individual counseling levels within your care team we can get you connected to um, therapists that special with specialize in women that uh, uh, in sorry all cancer survivors um, support groups are another great place to have uh, access to emotional health counseling um, if you've got questions, again, we can see we've got a Thrive video on this. We've got some great resources available online. Um, there are things, little ways you can help yourself, whether nature is important to you. And we've got a handout. Actually, uh, there's a clinical trial available. It's in your folder for um, your age group, a nature-based intervention. If anybody's interested in pursuing that, we have the information in there. Um, finding um, creativity, spending time with friends and families, finding a new hobby, picking something new up, meeting some new people, picking up an old hobby, journaling. Um, again, we see exercise as a way to lift lift spirits related to emotional health, uh, prayer or meditation might be effective. So just consider what what you've done in the past and being open to maybe finding new tools as well. Your support circle is very impactful as well when you're looking at emotional well-being. Re research shows that a good support system can be very helpful and also even improve cancer treatment outcomes. So if you're feeling alone, and we heard that in one of the other videos, if you're feeling alone, if you're feeling like you've not got other support um, places for you know that there there are there are places and whether you connect in with your care team with your local social worker they can help you find some of those additional support services if needed other uh, options are uh, hobby groups travel buddies friends or families co-worker uh, religious or cultural communities as a source of support And then strengthening your support circle, the most um, effective thing, and when I say effective, it's difficult to start, right? But opening up that communication, letting folks know what you can do, what they can do for you, how they can help at the time, um, if it feels right to you. Sharing your stories so much here, we've heard just such great conversation and are so thankful for all of you for sharing, um, sharing your experiences to feel the warmth and the laughter in here, I think has really been beneficial and therapeutic. So I hope you're able to continue and find some of that in your outside, outside of the conference today. Um, um, finding we've got a great source of resources out in our vendor space, you know, great opportunities with support groups and exercise groups. They're um, becoming a mentor with others, becoming a volunteer. Um, anybody have thoughts to, I saw one <laughs> had nod. I um, diagnosed last um, summer and I went through um, finding a therapist and then 
to have a mentor and I am, I'm still currently in treatment, but I am, I'm now going to become a mentor here. I just went through the training program last week and I'm just, I'm thrilled to walk someone else with that journey through that, mm -hmm. through that tough time. So mm -hmm. great. Thank you so much. Yes. Firefly. They're here today too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do a training program. Yeah. And there's the, we have a table here today. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Same here. I'm a mentor at Firefly Sisterhood. Um, currently, I'm a mentor for three of the young ladies. Great. Thank you. Other comments? We've got just um, one more video here. three words at my very first mammogram you have cancer I remember pausing and being like you can't be talking to me um, and I remember I actually got the phone call and you know she explained it to me and I didn't hear a whole lot of anything that she said I just was like how is this possible like it's not in my family so I just felt like I needed answers I think just being diagnosed in itself was so shocking that you know you worry about I, I was 34 I had 10 month old twins and two kids, uh, two kids that were one was three, one was five. And just the thought of you worry about them all the time. I, I worried about my work and my kids and dinner and my house and my husband and my how I was going to do this. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, what? What? Um, being 23, when you're diagnosed, you're not worried about being sick, right? You just graduated two years out of college. You're worried about the next happy hour, um, the next promotion. You're trying to build a career, your life. And all of a sudden, you're just kind of like, all right, stop for a second. What's going on? OK, I'm sick. What do I have to do? It's just I went through this as initial shock where I was like, bam, 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 chemo, surgery, radiation, all these things being thrown at me. And I had to make these decisions on my own. Uh, so two years ago, I was 36 when I was diagnosed. Uh, I was diagnosed with triple negative uh, but I was also diagnosed that I had the BRCA2 gene. With the gene, they say that it's got to be family related. I think the genetics is the surprising part because you have your kids, so they have a 50-50% chance of getting it. Um, so I think that's my big fear. The first few months after I was diagnosed was, was tough. Um, I was very hyper-focused on whether or not I was going to die. Am I going to walk my kids down the aisle? Am I going to, am I going to be around? Um, that was scary. So ever since the diagnosis and, you know, going through treatment and all that, I definitely have a different outlook on life. I've lost a lot of friends um, because I don't know if they just couldn't relate or I had come to a place in my life where, you know, I don't really want to sit around and talk about what's happening on TV or you're mad about something. You know, real life is happening for people. And some of those little things that probably we would have lots of conversations about before just weren't important to me. I feel like it's difficult for me to um, interact or hang out with people that haven't been through something as heavy. Like, I don't really care that your cat ate your underwear. <laughs> like, it's not that big of a deal, you know? Um, so it kind of shifts things into a, a perspective at, um, at a younger age. And I think I appreciate that a little bit. Being diagnosed with breast cancer has definitely changed my outlook towards life, the future. And so I try to make sure that, you know, even in the middle of chemo, every Saturday I took my daughter to ballet. I mean, just make, being there for those little things that um, I didn't want to let pass by. Um, I didn't want to be too busy for that anymore. I quit my job in investment banking and finance and was like, all right, I'm done with this. I don't want to sit in front of three computer screens doing something I absolutely hate. So then I switched fields and now I'm going to be, I'm going to school for physician assistant. And so in that light, it's the fluffy, happy stuff. It's like, oh, okay, I'm doing something better. I'm taking this experience and turning it into something great. But then there's days where I'm just so absorbed into like this dark hole I'm just angry. I don't want to do with anything else or anyone else. Um, and that's something I can't explain to anyone. You know, for as long as I can remember, I've always taken care of everyone else. 
and now it's my turn. So I really use it as time to be selfish. And I think some people had a hard time dealing with that, especially if they called me and wanted me to do something and I said no. So I think it caused me to realize that I needed to take better care of me. So that's what I started doing and haven't stopped. So I think in the essence of time, we are going to keep moving. But if there if there's anybody, a quick comment or two here about anything you learned or saw in the video. Yes, please. Um, not a learning, but a question in terms of self-care. I'm post-lumpectomy, just got my port pre-chemo, all I want is a massage. <laughs> um, are there specific places you can go? Because I'm afraid to lay on my stomach. Yeah. Yeah. Massage is part of my self-care. I get those regularly. And I always, some places have it, they don't always, but a breast pillow where it's like truly like a wedge cutout. And I, because I still am several years out, I still don't feel comfortable lying on my stomach. But some places will have that and if they don't i roll towels like in between and you can still do it really and if you work with a great um therapist they'll work with you and they you could just say i because i didn't want my port touched either like don't touch anything around here and then mm -hmm. when i'm on my stomach i would need to be touched this way if you're really communicative they should be really helpful thank you I was just going to say I've gotten massages for years and um, I didn't want to miss out on massage either. I think the main thing when I went back to it was that I didn't have any drains in and that things were healed. Um, but I just was upfront with what I had been going through with the therapist and um, she actually did the massage on the, on my side and I thought, well, this is not even going to be anything like what I'm expecting it. To, and it was so amazing and she did the positioning because I have expanders in and so nothing drops like your normal breast tissue and um I wanted to be comfortable on my side and so we just did pillows and it was I went to sleep it was glorious so yeah just being up front and open I was just going to touch on the topic of work uh, that was in the video. Uh, that is one of my biggest challenges right now is uh, dealing with the pressures and stress of work and how that impacts potentially my health um, in the future. And uh, all I want to do is retire, honestly, um, but that's not an option at the moment. So how do I find work that's fulfilling and doesn't kill me, so to speak? Yeah. Um, so that's something that I'm working through with therapy and, and others involved. So great. Thank uh, you. It's a real thing. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to invite you in your packet. I believe on the left hand side, they, we have an opportunity here. We're going to do a little exercise to do a little reflection on today, what you've heard, and then what you want to do next, whether it be in the next three months. Well, this says three months to be funded. Yes, this, you should have this one letter to self in your packet. There should be an envelope in there as well. But just take a minute, if you would, um, and write a note to yourself what you hope to accomplish in the next three months. Um, and then tuck it away. Put it somewhere where you remember to open it and don't lose it. Um, but yeah, follow the prompts on the page there. And we'll just give you a couple minutes here. And if it doesn't feel like something you want to do today, maybe write it to yourself in three months, depending where you're at.
And then as you're finishing, there's no rush here. Um, we will invite you to join us for lunch in the cafeteria, cafe, in the cafe. Um, we'll have uh, Dr. Edosa is going to start just shortly after 12, so that should be time for you to gather your lunch items. We will not be coming back into this room, um, so if you want to gather your things, bring them with you. And then following lunch, that's when we'll have those breakout sessions. There'll be some on this floor and then some up on another floor. But again, just thank you for everything. The resources are provided in the, in the slide deck if you're looking for some additional references. And then, sorry, Lisa, for the evaluation, is this, um, is this the only place we have it? It'll come in the email as well. Okay. So yes, either we'd, we love your feedback, of course, and I, I know lunch is pending. Maybe we'll leave this up in between um, or it'll come via email, but truly thank you all for spending some time with us to hear today. Um, the afternoons are, are optional as well, so if you need to leave here after lunch, but we really do thank you and we would love to hear your feedback so we can continue to offer this program and other programming through our survivorship services here at uh, Masonic and Fairview. So thank you all for attending. Thank you.